Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome to Depictions of Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs. Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland holds a news conference in Nova Scotia after touring a local winery. She discusses her government's record on keeping small businesses and highlights a $166 million investment into Canada's wine sector that was previously announced in 2022 federal budget. She is also with um, local MP, Liberal MP uh, Cody Bios, and he is in the King's Heights uh, riding. Also with her is a uh, owner and president of the Dome de Grand Prix uh, winery and they're all taking part in the, in the event and the, we do have to actually have to ask ourselves a question how far has the liberal government gone to support small businesses how, how much of that actually has has been effective in keeping a lot of the small businesses alive, especially through the pandemic and with the this new economic uh, downturn due to the war in Ukraine, where products and supplies were were on short hand and short notice. There were a number of, of businesses that actually did fold. Um, and some of it was due to the fact that they didn't necessarily qualify for the programs that were offered by the liberal federal government. So how great is their actual track record? We have to ask ourselves that. Look around your community and Think about that question when you look at what businesses are open and what businesses aren't open. We also need to think about um, how reluctant the uh, liberal government was to stop feeding the oil companies subsidies and putting those monies towards small businesses. So just some things to think about as we're listening to Christia Friedland talk about how great their track record is for small business. And it's a top winery region in Atlantic Canada. The wine industry of Nova Scotia is going through a very important period of transition. For me personally, it's a key question the existing regulatory and jurisdiction of the provincial liquor uh, corporations. Knowing it's a provincial issue, it could be time for our government in Ottawa to start a serious process to change the system and create a federal regulation like in 99% of the world wine region and countries. With an open Canadian wine market, we would never have enough local wine and we could downplay the export market. 
Miss Freeland. I wish you a very good time here in Nova Scotia. Enjoy our excellent seafood and perfect wine pairing. We know that time as a politician is never easy. So take this time and enjoy your visit with us. All the best. I'll pass it now over to our Member of Parliament, Cody Blois. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Hans Peter. It's great to be here in Grand Pre uh, in the beautiful Annapolis Valley, and welcome to uh, what is truly, well, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, really important to the history of Nova Scotia, very important to the Annapolis Valley. Hans Peter, let me start uh, by thanking you and the entire Stutes family and indeed all the employees here at Domaine de Grand Pre for a wonderful welcome. Uh, we had the opportunity to tour your vineyard to be able to see the grapes and the innovation and the work that goes on uh, and it's truly exceptional and of course uh, you uh, are a pioneer in the Nova Scotia wine industry. Uh, we've had the opportunity to talk with Jurg and, and uh, Beatrice. You're truly a family-owned business uh, who are continuing to drive that innovation. Uh, but you were at the ground uh, back in the late 1990s, uh, early 2000s, and drove the innovation. And of course, we've gone from four wineries in Nova Scotia uh, up to 22. And that's a testament to the innovation across the province, but indeed to your family-run business right here in the Annapolis Valley. I also want to take the opportunity to thank uh, my colleague, our Deputy Prime Minister, our Minister of Finance, uh, Krestia. It's great to have you in rural Nova Scotia. Uh, it's great to have you here in the Annapolis Valley. Uh, certainly appreciate your leadership on many files, uh, but thank you for taking the time. And we were very fortunate to have beautiful weather to welcome you here to our lovely province. I can't state enough how important uh, the wine industry is to Nova Scotia, but indeed to this region of Nova Scotia. And as Hans Peter alluded to, uh, this business got started in the late 1990s, and there has been an explosion of growth for a number of reasons. Uh, one, we're proud of the entrepreneurism. Uh, we're proud of our small business owners that help to drive innovation in the wine sector in Nova Scotia. But you might feel that Nova Scotia heat today, uh, 30 plus degrees. We're in a microclimate here in the Annapolis Valley, which actually allows uh, the grapes to grow uh, really in what is truly a, becoming a world region for wine. Um, and the fact of the matter is that climate change, although we have to be concerned and we have to be able to mitigate it, in this instance, it's actually creating a net benefit for our agriculture sector across uh, the Annapolis Valley, but indeed our Nova Scotia wine sector. But it's important that the Government of Canada is there to help support that innovation and that work at the same time. And um, we've seen that over a number of decades where governments have been there to support. And it's I'm going to pass it over to my colleague to give you more details about that work that we're doing. But I just want to highlight a couple different things. Uh, Hans Peter mentioned interprovincial trade. Uh, anytime I have the chance to be in Parliament, this is something that I raise. I want to highlight that on the federal side, we have done absolutely everything we can to make sure that we've eliminated any federal restrictions on interprovincial trade of alcohol, indeed for our wonderful wine products here in Nova Scotia. I also want to highlight to the innovation. We heard earlier today the importance of the Kenful Research Station and the work that goes on to make sure that we have uh, the scientific research to support the ap application of business principles uh, and the good work that goes on in wineries. Whether or not it's Living Labs, whether or not it's the On-Farm Climate Action Program, there's been nearly $1.5 billion over the last two years that has been directed specific to agriculture around sustainability, but indeed around innovation and research to make sure that we can capture some of the opportunities that are happening. And indeed, last, our Canadian Wine Investment Program, which uh, was announced in Budget 2021. Uh, we also had an additional announcement to strengthen that program. And that doesn't just happen. Uh, it happens because we have parliamentarians that listen to Canadians, that understand the opportunities. Uh, and uh, Minister Freeland, I want to thank you personally. Uh, because, of course, there is undoubtedly a number of issues and priorities uh, that come across your desk every day as the Minister of Finance. Uh, but the leadership that you've shown on this particular file, I hope that you've seen personally, I know you have, about what this investment means to help drive family businesses here in the Annapolis Valley, but indeed across the country. So I'm going to turn it over to you to give us some more details, but thank you so much for all your leadership, and thank you to everyone for being here on this lovely sunny day in the Annapolis Valley. Thank you. Okay, bravo. Oh, yeah, I'll give you a hug. Mm. Okay.
Okay, well, thank you for that very kind introduction, Cody. Um, and, you know, I think Hans Peter said at the end of his remarks that time as a politician is never easy. I appreciate that consideration, Hans Peter, but as we were discussing, I grew up on a farm. And there are no people in the world who work harder than farmers. And so I'm so happy to be here uh, on a farm, on a vineyard, to learn about the wonderful work that is being done here every day. And I got a little bit of a lesson in running a vineyard. I learned a little bit about what you do with the vines and stuff. I'd, I'd like to spend a little more time seeing how you run your tractors. Um, so that was wonderful, and no, really, I'm very interested. It was great, and just great to be here. Um, so let me start by acknowledging that we are gathered in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I am so happy to be here with my wonderful colleague, Cody Blade, in beautiful Grand Pre. And I do want to say to everybody here, Cody is an excellent relentless representative for you all yeah it is true give him a hand and you know I have learned basically that resistance is futile uh, when Cody says to me that this community needs something I trust him because I know he listens to people here and I also know that if I don't give him what he needs if I don't give all of you what you need, my life will not be worth living. So, <laughs> it's totally true. Uh, and I am really grateful to Cody for being such a good representative and for being such a great colleague. I really want to thank the Stutz family for welcoming me here and for showing me the work that goes into running this incredible vineyard and this incredible business. Uh, I really believe that small businesses, small entrepreneurial, family-run businesses are the heart of our communities, they're the heart of our country, they're the heart of our economy, and really spending some time here seeing the innovation, the passion, the hard work, the ideas, the community spirit that goes into the work here, it's been really inspiring for me. So thank you very, very much. Um, and what a great way to wrap up a few days that I've been visiting Atlantic Canada uh, in the heart of a community that is home to a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, Domaine de Grand Pré is truly a national and international treasure, and I feel very privileged to be here today. While I've been traveling through Atlantic Canada, I have been talking about the importance of industries that our supply chains depend on, industries like trucking, industries like shipping and our ports. But you know what? I'm here today because I really understand how important businesses like this one, small entrepreneurial, family-run rural businesses, how important they are to the Canadian economy. Grand Pre and other wineries like this one across Canada are real drivers of tourism. They create great, well-paying local jobs in communities like this one. And that's why in June our government announced a $166 million investment in Canada's wine sector. This new wine sector support program will offer support to wineries to help them stay innovative and competitive for years to come. And I want to remind everyone, the application deadline for the first year of the program is August 12th. So please, be sure, don't miss the deadline, get your applications in. We're keen to support wineries across the country. Canada is home to some of the best wineries and grape growers in the world. And our government wants to be sure that our wine sector can continue to thrive. Hans Peter has spoken about interprovincial trade and how much this winery and the Annapolis Valley could benefit from lifting all the barriers to interprovincial trade. And I want to say to you, Hans Peter, and to all the Canadians who are listening, the federal government 100% supports 
creating truly free trade across our amazing country. You know, I'm the finance minister and I am always thinking, how can we help our economy to grow? How can we create more great jobs? How can we make the cost of living more affordable? If tomorrow we lifted all barriers to trade between Canadians, if we harmonized all of our regulatory requirements, if we did that tomorrow, and it's in our control as Canadians, that would be such a boost to our economy. And it, it, it wouldn't be abstract. It would be a specific... And you know what? It would help us bring down inflation too. Peter brought this up. I do want to to all of my provincial counterparts. I think there's a lot of support across the country. Federal government is 100 The Canadian economy sector, they're recovering from the COVID pandemic and from the COVID recession. But I also recognize that inflation is making life more expensive for families here in Kings County, just as it is for people across the country and around the world. We all know that inflation is a global phenomenon it's driven by Vladimir Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine, by China's COVID zero policies, and by the snarled supply chains that are affecting people and businesses around the world. Je sais que les Canadiens et les Canadiens ont ressenti les effets quand ils vont à l'épicerie, et aussi quand ils vont mettre de l'essence dans leur voiture ou leur camion. Alors, pour les Canadiens et les Canadiens, qui ont le plus besoin. Notre gouvernement a mis en place un plan pour rendre la vie plus abordable. Ce plan va les aider directement à faire face à l'augmentation du coût de la vie. Our government's affordability plan includes an enhanced Canada's, Canada workers' benefit that will put up to $2,400 more dollars into the pockets of low-income families. Childcare fees, which are being cut by an average of 50% across the country this year. If you have a little kid in daycare, that's making a big difference. A 10% increase in old age security for seniors 75 and over, and that kicked in last month, just when our seniors need it. Dental care for Canadians with income under $90,000 per year, beginning with children under 12. And that support is going to go to those families, to those kids, starting this year. A $500 payment to help people who rent and who are struggling with the cost of housing. And again, that support is going to arrive this year. And I heard from Hans Peter and his family that affordable rental is a challenge in rural communities like this one as well. So I'm really glad that we're going to be able to provide that extra support now. And then, of course, our main support programs, including the Canada Child Benefit, the GST credit, the Canada Pension Plan, Old Age Security, and the GIS, the Guaranteed Income Supplement, are indexed to inflation and will be increasing. For a family here in Kings County with an income of $45,000 and a child in daycare, this affordability plan could mean roughly an additional $7,300 on top of existing benefits this fiscal year. A senior with a disability living, say, in Halifax could benefit from over $2,500 more this year than she received last year. And it's really important to remember that these measures are not pouring unnecessary fuel on the flames of inflation. Elles sont prévues dans notre cadre financier Côté triple A. 
elles ont également été prises en compte dans le budget responsable que nous avons déposé en avril. Dans ce budget, nous nous sommes engagés à réduire de façon responsable les dépenses gouvernementales de 9 milliards de dollars. But for the Canadians who need this support the most, the most vulnerable Canadians among us, these measures represent new money that they did not receive last year, and they will make life more affordable at exactly the right time. C'est une période difficile pour les pays du monde entier. Et ce sont en aucun doute une période difficile pour les Canadiens. But thanks to amazing business like Domaine Grand Prix and the wonderful, hardworking, entrepreneurial people who work here, there is absolutely no better country in the world than Canada. And there... It's really true, isn't it? We are so lucky to be here. And, you know, I'm just going to conclude by saying I do recognize this is a challenging time. And it's a challenging time that comes after two really hard years of COVID. And I know it can sometimes feel like there's no relief, that now we have some fresh challenges. But I also really recognize, and I think it's important for us all to recognize, that we, no country in the world is better positioned economically to deal with these new challenges. We should be really rooted and strengthened by that knowledge. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, yeah, just shout though so I can hear you. I'm not, I'm a little bit deaf in one ear, but. Je vais essayer, monsieur. Canada's lost 31,000 jobs in July. It's a second straight monthly decline after 43,000 jobs lost in June. Um, what is your action to today to those numbers? And are you out this week on the need to create good jobs and tackle inflation and the affordability problem? Um, so let me start by talking about the jobs numbers and I think the most important thing for Canadians to bear in mind is the unemployment rate today was confirmed to be at 4.9%. That is a historic low for Canada, and that is good news for Canadians. Really, right now, when I talk to businesses and when I talk to labor union leaders, our big economic challenge when it comes to the labor market is a shortage of workers and a shortage of workers with the skills we need. And that is something our government is absolutely focused on. So, you know, I am really glad to be able to say again today with this latest data release that unemployment is so low, that it is at 4.9%. When we were fighting the COVID recession, for our government, the priority was to preserve Canadian jobs and to preserve the economic muscle of the country so that jobs could come roaring back when we lifted the pandemic restrictions. And that's what's happened. Alors, en français, euh, le niveau au Canada euh, reste à 4,9%. C'est une record historique et c'est une bonne nouvelle pour les Canadiens et les Canadiens. Cette semaine et pendant tout l'été, j'ai parlé avec plusieurs employeurs, j'ai parlé aussi avec les syndicats. Et ce que tout le monde me dit, c'est que le défi auquel le Canada fait face en ce qui concerne les emplois, 
c'est la pénurie de main d'œuvre. On a aujourd'hui une manque de gens qui ont les, euh, la formation nécessaire pour faire des travaux si nécessaire pour l'économie canadienne. Et je vais finir en disant que je suis très, très fière de ce chiffre de 4,2%. C'est une record. Notre gouvernement a travaillé pendant la récession de COVID très, très fort pour préserver les emplois pour les Canadiens et Canadiennes. Et je suis très fier qu'on a réussi. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. And when it comes to the housing market, that is something that we watch very closely. And in fact, this week I met with one of the leaders of one of Canada's major banks, one of our main subjects of conversation was the housing market and we have a lot of conversations with our economists at the Department of Finance about where the housing market is. We are watching the situation very, very closely. Our government is absolutely focused on housing affordability, on ensuring that Canadians, the Canadians who want to buy a house are able to buy one and on ensuring that the Canadians who rent are able to find a good, decent place to live and we're going to, be conti we're going to continue to be focused on that. This is a market where conditions are changing and we are watching the situation very, very closely and prepared to take additional action if necessary. Et maintenant, Français, euh, en ce qui concerne le marché immobilier, euh, notre gouvernement comprend que c'est une situation euh, qui change beaucoup maintenant. On est très reconnaissante de ça et on parle beaucoup avec les banques principales du Canada et les économistes du ministère du Finance. Pour nous, la priorité, c'est l'abordabilité. C'est très important pour nous d'avoir un pays dans lequel les Canadiens et les Canadiens qui le veulent peuvent acheter une maison. Et c'est aussi très important pour tout le monde, s'il veut acheter une maison ou non, de tous avoir une maison, une maison propre, une maison dans sécurité pour sa famille. Et c'est pour cette raison que la portabilité est au cœur de notre politique économique. Good afternoon and welcome to the beautiful Annapolis Valley. We heard quite a bit about the wine sector support program today. Do you know what the uptake has been so far? How many applicants? What the response has been from the sector? Uh, I would say the response has been very enthusiastic. Um, you have some leaders of the sector who are here and if they want to talk to you about it, they can tell you their own views. I'm not going to put words in their mouth. Um, we're not going to talk about the number of applicants until the application deadline has closed. But I think it is fair to say, you know, this is a plan that we worked on very closely with people in the sector itself to build. And so far, the feedback that I have had has been positive. It's only a two-year program. Is there anything long-term in the work so that the wine industry knows what they can expect as far as support from the federal government? You know, that's a good question. I think that everyone recognizes that we are living in a very volatile time 
for the Canadian economy and for the global economy. And so from my perspective, this is a time to maintain quite a lot of policy agility and flexibility and to be prepared to respond to the situation as it evolves. Uh, having said that, I do want to say today, since I'm here with some great representatives of the Nova Scotia and Canadian wine sector, we understand your importance to the Canadian economy, to local communities, and we understand the importance of being your partner and ensuring you can thrive this year, next year, and in the years to come. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.